speaker for today is Liam McAllister from Cornell, and he'll talk about small cosmological constants in string theory. Thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. This talks about the cosmological constant problem, which stems from the fact that the observed vacuum energy is extremely small in natural units. And this problem is just too hard. So let's try and consider a supersymmetric version. Why don't we consider a vacuum energy that's extremely small in magnitude, but negative? And let's try and ask if we can explain how an exponentially large supersymmetric universe could arise in a theory with a small fundamental length scale. Now, there's a principle I'd like to state, um, which goes as follows. It's better to light a lamppost than to curse the dark energy. And what I mean by that is we're going to work where computations are possible. We're not making any claim of genericity, not trying to find the general solution of string theory with small cosmological constant, but just to establish existence of certain kinds of solutions. And that'll be important. So specifically, we're going to choose a setting where the vacuum structure is dominated by well-understood superpotential terms that are set by integer data, namely by topology and quantized fluxes. There, we're going to systematically compute the superpotential and find vacua. The specific setting I have in mind is type 2b flux compactifications on Calabia orientifolds that are hypersurfaces and toric varieties. There, we will compute the superpotential by exploiting toric structures and by using some purpose built software. But how are we going to get to small vacuum energy? The foundational idea in this approach, uh, in this subject, is that quantized fluxes in a high-dimensional lattice might possibly be chosen to make the cosmological constant small. Uh, in an n-dimensional buso polchinski flux landscape, the potential energy function looks like minus a large constant plus an expression that's quadratic in the quantized fluxes stitched together by a metric. And the idea is that you could try to choose... Uh, the fluxes so that you fine-tune a large number of terms here to precision exponential in the dimensionality and achieve a small CC. The problem with this approach is that achieving an exponential hierarchy is exponentially costly. And it seems that the kinds of hierarchies we see in nature are just out of reach. So we're going to work with a mechanism. We introduce a mechanism for getting small vacuum energy that doesn't require us to work in a high-dimensional lattice. We're going to work in low-dimensional lattices limited by our computational ability up to about dimension 10. And there we will solve a Diophantine problem to find vacua in which all the perturbative terms are exactly zero along one dimension in the moduli space. Well, when all the perturbative terms are gone, what remain are non-perturbative terms, instantons, and these are naturally exponentially small. What we will then do is make discrete and explicit choices of the topology and the quantized fluxes that fine-tune the exponents in the instantons to polynomial precision. So here's an actual example that I'll present. This is the superpotential. Tau is the axiodiloton. And you see here two exponentials in tau, one with exponent 7 29 and one with exponent 7 28 So we achieve that by a specific choice of, of fluxes. Now, if one considers a superpotential of this form and tries to minimize it, um, the vacuum energy turns out to be, well, the ratio of these two terms, these two prefactors, to a power that's determined by the difference of the exponents. And it turns out to be 10 to the minus 122. Now, I should stress, we're not trying to build a model of the real, real universe today. This is an entertaining numerical coincidence that this is actually the observed value. Okay, we should think all this large hierarchies I present should be just thought of as a very large hierarchy, not the specific observed one. Another key point is that the distribution of vacuum energies that we find is uniform on a log scale, not uniform on a linear scale. So it's much, much easier to find small vacuum energy in our approach. So uh, here's a one slide summary of, of all of our results. If you want to take away one uh, set of statements, here they are. We find solutions of type 2b string theory of the form ADS4 cross X6 with X6 a Calabia orientifold. The solutions preserve four-dimensional n equals one supersymmetry. The vacuum energy is exponentially small, and these solutions feature hierarchical scale separation with the ADS length exceeding the Kaluza-Klein length by factors as large as 10 to the 100. 
Now, the mechanism is a racetrack of world sheet instantons, as I will explain. And what happens is the vacuum energy ends up being an exponential in integers that are determined by topological data, Gopukumar, Vafa invariance, uh, and flux quanta, as in the example that I've shown and will keep on showing. So here are the people who did all the work. Mehmet Demirtis, Manki Kim, Jakob Moritz, Andres Rios Tascon were involved in the paper that's the primary source for today's talk in 2021. And then we have substantial ongoing work also with Naomi Gendler and Richard Nally that I'll mention at the end if I can. Okay, the plan's simple. First, I'll explain how we computed the superpotential, and then I'll explain how we control corrections to the Kähler potential. So we're working in type 2b flex compactifications. The moduli that we'll deal with are the axiodiliton, H21 complex structure moduli, H11 Kähler moduli. And once we've chosen some quantized three-form fluxes, then it's well understood what general form the superpotential takes. It looks like this. The sum of a flex term and a non-perturbative term, where the flex term is the integral of G3 wedge omega, omega the three-zero form. Now, the flex superpotential around large complex structure can be written as a set of terms polynomial in the moduli, plus a generally infinite sum of terms exponential in the moduli. And likewise, the non-perturbative superpotential from D-brain instantons, specifically Euclidean D3 brains, takes the form of a generally infinite sum of exponentials in the Kähler moduli, Ti, times prefactors, Fafian prefactors, that depend on the other closed string moduli. Now, this is the general form, and it's a little too complicated for us to handle. So what we'll do is we'll make very specific choices of topological data to enforce simplification. So what we'll do is we'll ensure that, first of all, this polynomial term here is exactly zero. I'll call that a perturbatively flat vacuum. Uh, secondly, the exponential terms here are well approximated by just two exponentials with nearly equal exponents. That's what I'll call a racetrack. Both of these things are asks, but I shall find the topological data that allows me to pay for them. And finally, another thing that we'll ask for and, and ensure we pay for is that the Fafian prefactors here are not dependent on the closed string moduli tau and ZA, but are constants. So when we've done all of those things, the superpotential takes the form shown here in red. It's a sum of two exponentials in the axiodiliton, plus at least H11 exponentials in the Kähler moduli, plus negligible. We'll have then shown what the superpotential is. And since everything here is an exponential, it stands to reason that if we can find a minimum, the vacuum energy in the minimum is going to be naturally exponentially small. Also, there are no unknown functions that matter here. There's just a few unknown numbers, these prefactors and exponents, and those we'll try to determine. So a little bit more detail about some of the things I've, the properties I've indicated here. First, a perturbatively flat vacuum. What is that? We find quantized fluxes for which the polynomial part of the flux superpotential vanishes identically along one complex direction in the moduli space. A direction in which the complex structure moduli vector is proportional to the axiodiliton by some vector of constant rational numbers. So we can use the axiodiliton as the coordinate along the valley and measure our progress along the valley that way, and the complex structure deformations transverse to the valley are heavy and can be integrated out. But the along valley modulus remains light, in fact, massless so far, and we'll deal with it later. So that's a perturbatively flat vacuum. What about a racetrack? So a racetrack is an old idea. We can think about it just in a supersymmetric field theory of a single field Z. Suppose the superpotential is the sum of two falling exponentials like this with n1, n2, p1, and p2, some numbers. Well, the superpotential goes to zero at real z goes to infinity, but it has a local minimum at finite z. Um, and if you can convince yourself in a minute of calculus that if these two prefactors have opposite signs, then the value that the superpotential takes at the minimum is given by this expression. And the point of this expression is that if the exponents p1 and p2 are very close to each other, and the prefactors n1 and n2 are even a little bit hierarchical, then the result will be exponentially small. That's the core mechanism. Writing this down in a supergravity theory um, is an old game. What we've done is to actually find solutions in string theory where this is exactly what comes out. So how does that happen? Um, I'll remind you the prepotential for the complex structure moduli has a polynomial piece and an instantonic piece. The polynomial piece 
has coefficients determined by the topological data of the mirror. Details don't matter. All that matters is that it's something that one knows. And the instantonic piece is a sum over curve classes in the mirror of uh, GV invariant, genus zero, uh, times a trilogarithm of an exponential in the moduli. The point being that the collection of exponentials with knowable prefactors. Now, what does this have to do with the flux superpotential? Well, if we introduce the periods, which are the integrals of the three zero form over a basis of three cycles, and if we remind ourselves that the flux superpotential is the pairing of the three-form flux with omega, we can also write the flux superpotential as a pairing of a period vector with a vector of quantized fluxes. So, if we can compute the periods, or the prepotential, and we know the quantized fluxes, then we know the flux superpotential. So the task is to compute the periods. So how do we do that? Well, uh, the principles for how to do this have been clear for decades. Um, our contribution is really doing it in Calabia threefolds with many moduli. Uh, specifically, we do this in hypersurfaces in toric varieties as classified by Kreitzer and Skarka. So with Clem's package instanton, one can carry out the mirror map and compute the periods uh, up to a number of complex structure modules, let's say 10, if you work hard. Uh, with our open source software package CY Tools, written by my students Mehmet Demirtas and Andres Rios Tascon, we can access anything in the Kreutzer Skarka list up to the maximum available, 491 complex structure moduli. And as I'll show you, we can compute GV invariants to extremely high degree, uh, even in high dimensional moduli spaces. So this is the key capability that enabled the work. With this capability, here's an example that we found. So here's a flux superpotential in a Calabia with five complex structure moduli and 113 Kähler moduli. We find a choice of quantized fluxes. Shown here, there's some nice ordinary size integers, such that along a particular direction in the moduli space, parameterized by this relatively reasonable rational vector, the polynomial part of the GVW superpotential is exactly zero. What remains are instantonic terms from 2a, and the leading ones have GV invariants minus 2 and 252. And you can work out that the superpotential looks like this. So I've put the first two terms in red. These are the ones with the almost equal exponents. And then the remaining term and all subsequent ones involve strictly higher powers of the very small quantity e to the minus 1 over a g string. So these are all terms that are knowable. One can compute them term by term, and they're all higher powers, and they can be neglected. We can focus on just the red terms, and when those two terms compete, we self-consistently ignore the remainder, and we find a minimum at polynomially small string coupling, 10 to the minus 2, 0 0.011 exactly, and exponentially small superpotential, 10 to the minus 62. And as promised, it's the ratio of the GV invariance to a power determined by the fluxes that shows up. Okay, so that's the core kind of example. We give other examples in the paper of the same sort. So the story so far is that we began with the superpotential of this general form. We made simplifications to restrict it to a much nicer form, shown in blue. A racetrack in the axiodiloton, and then some yet unspecified superpotential for the Kähler moduli. So I still have to tell you how we compute the superpotential for the Kähler moduli. That's a bit technical. Um, it was at least half of the work in the paper. In the interest of time, I won't uh, belabor it. I'll try and give an executive summary version. So the general form of the superpotential for the Kähler moduli is a sum over effective divisors of exponentials in the complexified uh, volumes divided by dual Coxeter numbers with Fafian prefactors. The sum over all effective divisors in principle. Now, what we did is to find Calabia threefolds in which the superpotential is well approximated by a sum only over prime toric divisors. A prime toric divisor is a zero of a toric coordinate. And uh, they're easy to understand, easy to compute. But in, in addition, we found cases where the prime toric divisors that do contribute have Fafians that are pure constants with no dependence on tau or z. So to do this, we select cases where at least H11 of the prime toric divisors are rigid and their F-theory uplifts have trivial intermediate Jacobian. Uh, in an oriented fold where all the seven brains lie in SO8 uh, stacks. 
So the rigidity condition is just the classic way of counting fermion zero modes uh, for a superpotential contribution. The condition of trivial intermediate Jacobian ensures that the Fafian is a section of a trivial bundle over the moduli space, i.e. it's a number. Now, actually computing this took a bit of work. We made use of some technology developed by Mankey Kim to compute these Hodge numbers by stratification in the F-theory uplift. But suffice it to say, the computation was carried out. Uh, the details are given in the paper. And now let's talk about how we actually find a vacuum, right? So we compute the superpotential along the lines that I've just presented so far in many compactifications. We select a case that has a desired structure, a case that has a good racetrack, a case that has a perturbatively flat direction. And then, given one, we search the Kähler moduli space for a supersymmetric vacuum. Having found such a vacuum, we determine whether the vacuum uh, survives string loop and alpha prime corrections. Now, uh, almost all the remainder of the talk is about this fourth point. But let me just briefly describe how we search through the Keller moduli space, or at least give you a picture of it. So this is a picture of the Keller moduli space, or at least a slice through the Keller cone, uh, in an example with 491 moduli. Each little polygon that you see there is a different triangulation of the parent toric variety. And they're connected by flops. And what can happen, it happened to us pretty much every time, is you start somewhere like, let's say, here in this phase, and it turns out that the supersymmetric vacuum, if one exists, is over somewhere far away. So you have to find your way through all of these phases to it. But we developed ways to do that. We could sort of take a bearing toward the solution and progress toward it. And now suppose we found a supersymmetric vacuum. But let me be very precise. When we get to this point here, what we've found is a place where the F terms that we have computed are zero. The burden of the remainder of the talk is to argue that those F terms that we have computed are, to excellent approximation, the true F terms of the full theory. Right? That's what I mean by control of corrections. Okay. So first, control of the superpotential. Well, here, I'll be brief because it's just a recap of the talk so far. We've shown by explicit computation that the superpotential takes the form of a two-term racetrack in the axial deleton plus a sum of instantonic terms from the prime toric divisors where the numbers here are set by choices of flexes, by GV invariants, and by the orientifold action. We ensure that the Fafian prefactors are non-zero numbers by standard zero-mode counting. Now, we don't know their numerical values. What we can check is that their numerical values have small effects. When W0 is extremely small, only a very, very large change in the Fafians leads to a large shift in the moduli VEFs. So, you know, explicitly, if you put in 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the 4, uh, nothing changes at all. You get undetectable shifts in our moduli VEVs, the vacuum still exists. But uh, it would be nice to know these, these values. Um, brief parenthetical remark, Euclidean D minus 1 brains are also negligible because we're at weak string coupling. So this is really all the relevant contributions to the superpotential. And the computation, in summary, of the superpotential is totally explicit up to the numerical values of the Fafian prefactors. Now here let me highlight some nice work by Alexandrov, Ferret, Kim, Sen, and Stefanski that's closing in on, but has not determined those values, and roughly speaking, shows that in very closely related examples, the ADIs take the form of 1 over 16 pi squared times the sum of positive quantities. But the detailed form of that sum is not always available. Okay, so totally explicit in terms of the superpotential. How about the killer potential? Well, first, let's talk about a conceptual point here, which is that we're working around a supersymmetric ADS minimum, so the F-term potential looks like this. And we've already shown that the superpotential is extremely small. So if we know the leading order Keller potential, K0, and we're wondering about some delta K, we only need to show that delta K is small enough not to destroy the vacuum. We don't need to show that delta K is some absurdly small value, uh, like the hierarchies I'm trying to establish, because that small number is already baked in to W. Okay, so we just need to show that delta K is small enough to allow perturbative control. Well, uh, at the point in moduli space that we find, the Einstein frame volumes of four cycles are quite large, comfortably large, 20 or, or 100, depending on what seven brains are on them. The string frame volumes are not. They're order unity. And the reason for that is that the string coupling is small by the same log 1 over W naught factor that makes the four cycle volumes large. So, 
the saving grace here is that we're at really weak string coupling. Remember, 0 0.011 in the example I keep showing. And so the leading corrections arise at string tree level to all orders in alpha prime. Moreover, the breaking of n equals 2 supersymmetry to n equals 1 comes from sources that are weighted by factors of the string coupling. So the leading corrections to the killer potential in our solutions are world sheet instanton corrections to the prepotential of the parent n equals 2 supersymmetric Calabiao. And those corrections we can compute because we can compute periods in Calabia threefolds with very large H21. So let's actually do that. Now I'm switching to computing GV invariants on the large dimensional side, 113 in my example, rather than 5. So the corrections to the prepotential look like a sum over curve classes in the Calabia of GV invariants times exponentials in the Keller moduli. And let's define the thing being summed, let's call it C. And we want to know, does this sum converge? Are we inside the radius of convergence? We know where we are. We're at some specified point in the Keller moduli space, and we'd like to know, is that inside or not uh, the radius of convergence? So to test this, we're going to compute the sum and and perform appropriately the ratio test. But there's two kinds of curves we have to think about. Curves for which this series in higher and higher degrees terminates at some finite degree, and curves that come in infinite series. Those that come in finite series are safely collapsible, they correspond to flops, and they give finitely many polylog corrections to the Keller potential, all of which we explicitly incorporate. But then we turn to the potent curves, the curves that come in infinite series. So here's an example. Um, in our standing example, we pick some particular potent curve and compute the GV invariance of C up to 10 times C, we get numbers like this. But then we keep going and go to 100C and get this GV invariant. Now, why do we do that? Well, to see that, we're getting an exponential increase with a very, very stable rate. So, since the GV invariants grow very stably with degree, and this clearly decays exponentially in the degree n, for some t, the falling exponential will win. The burning question is, um, are we at that value of t? So, just a brief remark, if you tried to do this in the quintic and use your favorite GV invariant, 2875, it's the analog of the three here, it's the first one in the series, to estimate the radius of convergence, you get the answer 1.27, and that's actually really close to the exact answer. So, it's not that bad a process, but we're not just sticking with the first thing, we're going quite deep. Okay, so in our vacuum, is T large enough? Well, so here's a plot of degree, the log of the sum and, and you see that for every curve class that we could find, the contribution decreases exponentially with increasing degree. So this shows uh, that we are inside the radius of convergence, and the world sheet instanton corrections uh, to the n equals 2 data are well controlled. Okay, so now there's, there's more to say about control. I'm sure we'll come to that in, in some discussions, either here or offline. But let me just connect this back to the general literature. Um, Katru, Kalash, Linda, and Trevedi made two claims in a famous paper in 2003. They said, claim one, in type 2b compactifications of the sort I've been describing, if the flux superpotential is small, then there can exist well-controlled supersymmetric ADS4 vacua. Claim two, if you have such a vacuum, in a compactification that also has more stuff, a warp deform conifold region with one or more anti D3 brains, then there can exist metastable de Sitter vacuum. I've said nothing in this talk about claim two, but I've given what I think is rather strong evidence for the first claim. So when I gave a review talk about de Sitter constructions at strings three years ago, uh, I said we were still awaiting complete and explicit compactifications. I would change that now. I think that for the purpose of ADS vacua, we can uh, say that we do have complete explicit compactifications. That's what I have just shown you. Whereas for de Sitter, it's still very much a work in progress. Okay, so let me conclude. We've constructed supersymmetric uh, vacua in Calabia orientifolds with exponentially small flux superpotential an explicit computation of the Euclidean D3 brain superpotential stabilizing the Keller moduli. The stabilization is at weak coupling and large Einstein frame volume. Our solutions feature small cosmological constants and giant scale separation. And the methods can be applied to build a corner of the landscape. The search for De Sitter, though, is a work in progress. Thank you.
Thank you very much for this nice talk. There's a question. Uh, Edward, please. Woman or Ed, either. Uh, nice talk, Liam. Uh, so in a paper that we wrote, you know, but I'm telling it for the others who don't know, may not know, uh, with uh, Luce and Wiesner, we pointed out what is an issue with your construction based on the conventional holography. Namely, if you replace your fluxes with brains, in this case D5 and S5 brains wrapped around three cycles, you find that in the class you chose, you actually don't get in a supersymmetric configuration. And it's actually related to the way you got your flat perturbative value to be flat. Namely, it corresponds to wrapping the cycles over brains and anti-brain configuration, so their area exactly cancels out to be zero at the tree level, and you get instant corrections. So the reason that you're getting something small is directly related because you don't have a supersymmetry. I suspect what goes wrong... Is it not? Okay. I think what, what may go wrong in your construction is that your computations of Kähler potential are not reliable. As you correctly say, you're at a situation where the sizes of your geometry are string scale. In that case, there is no non randomization theorem or anything simple to give you a reliable Kähler potential computation. Right. So um, it's, it is possible um, that there are corrections to the Keller potential that could disrupt this vacuum structure. That's certainly something that we wrestled with and acknowledged uh, in our paper. But something rather strong would have to happen for such a destabilization to occur. Because what we were able to show is that at uh, string tree level and in the n equals 2 model, the control is, is direct. We establish it completely. Next, you ask, um, what about breaking n equals 2 to n equals 1 and going from g string 0 to g string small? Um, for both of those things, there are you know, very substantial parametric suppression factors, uh, term by term, that we think, barring a conspiracy, uh, demonstrate control of the Keller potential. However, I can't exclude a conspiracy that, for example, the two-loop or three-loop correction to the Keller potential um, features anomalous enhancements by numerical factors of order 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 6 or something like that. If such a thing were to happen, it would remove this vacuum structure. But that's the kind of thing that, that needs to happen um, to, to remove these vacua. For, I have a much more simple-minded question. You have a direction in which the polynomial part of W is zero, but don't you have to differentiate the polynomial part in the normal directions uh, to find supersymmetry? Uh, you're, you're asking, how do I ensure uh, control of the other directions? The direction's transverse, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what one can do in, in it's straightforward to do this directly if W0 is extremely small, um, you can you integrate out the the transverse directions, and then you can check whether that integrating out is self consistent. Okay, and it's the corrections from integrating out the transverse directions are suppressed by powers of W naught. So, was that the nature of the question? Vacuum is not on your plane, but just slightly off it because W was so small. That's correct. Yes, yeah, so what we had to do um, both, yeah, thank you. So what we had to do both with respect to the stabilization of the complex structure moduli and with respect to stabilization of the Kähler moduli, neither point of which I mentioned during the talk in the of time, is begin with the solution at zero W naught and systematically incorporate the corrections in finite W naught and show that the corrections were small. So, so that we did for both kinds of moduli. Yeah. Uh, do you mean how we found the phase in which a vacuum occurs, or how we, how? Yeah, right. So um, the the trick here um, is, you know, you don't want to throw darts, right? Um, the trick instead is to um, find a sort of objective function that decreases step by step as you make, as you walk through one phase after another, and the way to make that computationally feasible is to. Um, not work with the big T variables, the four cycle volumes, which are the natural uh, ones in the EFT, but to work with the little t's, the curve volumes, which are the natural ones for this calculation, and relate those things and linearize step by step. And when you do that, you find you can walk with very little error. So that's what we did there. I don't see any other questions. Yep. One.
Is there an intuitive explanation of what it means to have this uh, line of uh, constant W or zero W that you are moving along? I mean, what is special about this configuration of fluxes? I mean, it looks like some um, accident, but... It, it, it is, um, it's a very mild accident. It's, let's say, a one in a hundred accident or something like that. And um, I think it's just the flip side of the often repeated statement that sufficiently generic fluxes stabilize all the moduli. These are then just, just barely insufficiently generic fluxes, and, and they leave one flat direction. And one can certainly find cases in which we, we do, in fact, stumble across cases in which the flat direction has dimension two. Uh, we just didn't control those ones as well, so we stuck to the one-dimensional ones. But it's roughly that the, the fluxes aren't uh, generic enough to pin down everything. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Liam again for his nice talk. Okay, and before you leave, uh, there are seven small announcements. So first, Alejandra, your phone has been found. It's in the office over there. Second, the person who lost the glasses, they also have been found, also in the office over there. Um, third, uh, there will be a reception with music and the poster session, which starts at 6 p.m., so soon. It's at the same place where we had lunch and uh, coffee breaks. Uh, those who haven't put up their posters, please do so before the poster session starts. And there are three people whose post, unfortunately, fell down. They're also in the office over there. Um, so you can pick them up and reattach them. So this is uh, Yang Rui Hu, Li Cheng Ren, and uh, Ji Hun Li. So the, your posters are over there in the conference office. Okay. And um, the info desk is now closed. So if you have any questions regarding registration or other aspects, also go to the conference office over there. And finally, um, the Audi Max will be closed uh, in a couple of minutes, so please leave uh, and make sure you take everything. Okay, see you.